Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, God is on the move. Amen. I mean, we can feel the spirit swirling around us. I had an amazing time of prayer with my prayer partner this morning, and we can just sense the Holy Spirit moving about. When we're doing Bible studies and when I'm in my own quiet time, I just get a sense that, oh, God is about to move in huge and amazing ways. We see God's hand in so many small ways, but I am convinced in my spirit that God is about to pour out amazing things upon his kingdom, upon this world, but through the kingdom. Amen and amen. Oh, don't miss it. Don't don't get out of the flow. Stay close to the Lord. Stay close to him in fellowship and in intimate relationship with him. Don't swerve to the left or detour to the right. Stay on the path, the way that has the truth and the life on it. That would be Jesus. You know, I don't just say things to say things, to open a show or to start a Bible study. I speak things and declare things that God has already spoken to my spirit. And I'm telling you, I can almost feel it in the spirit realm. I can just almost touch it. It's becoming so real. Don't miss it. Don't miss it because of weariness or doubt. Don't miss it because you're looking at the world or looking to somewhere else. You keep your eyes focused on what God's doing. You know, I love in the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, in whirlwind and storm is his way. We're about to have a whirlwind and storm, amen, and the elections, and we have winter coming up. We have all these things that are uh, impending uh, around us, but God is in it all. God is in it all, and he's about to do something spectacular. Don't miss it. Now, last week I did a study called Cave Dwellers. This week I'm doing a study called city dwellers. And God spoke to my heart that we as a church, as a body of believers, run to him as a refuge, as we're supposed to. You see, we don't run to the world. We don't run to reasoning. We don't run to uh, Egypt or to a pharaoh or to horses and chariots. We run to the living God. He's our refuge. And so he gave me a message about cities of refuge. Now, we can talk about, it would take me weeks to preach the cities of refuge as we find in the Old Testament. It would take me a long time to go in depth as to the name of each city and what each one of them means. And I might get to that one day on TV. I've already taught it in a Bible study a couple years ago. And it would take me so long just to, to delve deeply into it. But what I want or what God wants to show you today is something so beautiful, so powerful about Jesus being our city of refuge. Now, there's a twist at the end. Like always, God shows us something so revelational, so revelatory that it's just, it, it is, it, it is just going to just twist heads. I love it. I love his word. And I love when he does that in his word. So let me set the scene. Joshua has led Israel across the Jordan into the promised land, the land of Canaan. And Canaan has been possessed and subdued. The various tribes have received their inheritance on either side of the Jordan. And they're starting to wind, things are starting to wind down as far as the conquest of the land. But there's still so much to do to build cities, to build on their inheritance. Now, one of the things that they have to do right off is what we find in Joshua 20. And we find Israel carrying out a command that was first given to Moses back in the book of Numbers in chapter 35. They were to appoint six cities of refuge. 
six places, three on the east of the Jordan and three on the west of the Jordan. Now, I'm going to read a, a fairly long set of scriptures, and you could get bored through it, but don't lose sight of it. Stay focused on these scriptures because each word is so dripping with power and understanding and insight for us. So, this is Joshua chapter 20, the first six verses. Now the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there. Keep those two words, accidentally, unintentionally. And they shall be your refuge from the avenger of the blood. Keep that in mind. And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, that they may take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. Then if the avenger of the blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but he did not hate him beforehand. And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment and until the death of one who is a high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and to his own house to the city from which he fled. These cities were to be made available to someone who killed another person by accident or unintentionally. Now, I want to take that and move it out and use the word sin. These cities were made available to someone who sinned by accident or unintentionally. And they could flee to one of these six cities for safety and help. He could find refuge there. And if it was determined that the sin was an accident or unintentional, he could find safety from the avenger of the blood. So these cities were established as a refuge. Now listen, man did not come up with the idea for these cities. It was birthed in the heart and mind of God. Man did not determine that there needed to be six cities of refuge. It was God who spoke through Moses, now to Joshua, to the people of Israel, who have now landed in the promised land and have conquered it. And God said, out of my own heart, he said, I want a place so people can run to when they sin. I want a place where people can run to when they sin. Birthed out of the heart of God. Now, these cities of refuge remind us of Jesus. Oh, because he is our refuge, our hiding place. This shows us and portrays how Christ shelters the sinner from the avenger of the blood, from the one who wants to slay the sinner. We have fled to Jesus Christ. He is our eternal refuge. And no avenger, i.e. the enemy Satan, can touch us when we flee to the refuge. Oh, hallelujah. Let me show you a couple of verses. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Thus God, oh, love that, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Listen, listen. 
that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We have fled to refuge. That's Jesus. Proverbs 14.26 In the fear of the Lord there is a strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield. And buckler. You see, God set up in the Old Testament places where people who sin can run to for refuge so that the avenger cannot seek their death. Oh, Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But God, through Jesus in the New Testament, says, you don't need to run to a city now. I set the cities up until the one true refuge was on the earth. Now, I love the idea of a city of refuge. You see, once they got to that city of refuge, they were free to move about the city. They could live their lives in that city. They were free to shop and eat and worship and sing and visit and, and have fellowship with people. They were confined to quarters. They were in this city of refuge that was huge, that had people in it, that were free to live but within the city. They couldn't leave the city, but they were safe in the city. Now that's a picture of Jesus. If we stay in Jesus, we are free to live our lives. We are free to move about the cabin, right? We are free to fellowship and eat and, and to, to have joy in our lives. We are free, but still we have to stay within the city. We have to stay in Jesus. So I love the idea of the city, but God, oh, but God. You see, something else took place in the New Testament that did not take place in the Old. When we come to a city of refuge, or when we come to Jesus, we come because we're being pursued by a devourer, by someone who is seeking our lives. Why? Because we've committed sin and they are after us. That would be the enemy. That would be Satan. And he is the, what they call the, in this scripture, the avenger of the blood. Oh, he hates the blood. He hates the blood. He hates that there was blood shed that I might find the city of refuge. Amen. Oh, but there's something else. There's something else. Let me go back to Numbers. This is when the command was first given to Moses. Way back in Numbers 35, they had not, Israel had not even crossed into the promised land. They were still in the wilderness, and God had given Moses all of the instructions that he needed to bring them into the promised land. Now, we know that Moses never made it. Oh, but he did. You see, we think that God's promises are not true or that they, we give up on them too soon. This is a P.S. and by the way. You see, God promised Moses that he would see the promised land. But when Moses sinned in the desert, God said, you cannot go into the promised land. He let him see it from a mountaintop, but he could not go. And so we figure that that promise just died with Moses. Bo, but I'm here to tell you. That God fulfilled that promise to Moses because Moses did get to the promised land. If you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, two people showed up with Jesus. 
And one of them was Moses. And Moses didn't just get to show up in the promised land. He showed up in the promised land with the Savior of all creation, with the Savior of all mankind, with the Messiah King that was promised through the patriarchs. Moses set foot in the promised land on the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured among them. You see, God's promises are sure. They are true. Never, 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 never give up hope. Okay, that was P.S. And by the way, coming back now to Numbers 35. Moses was given an instruction on the cities of refuge. Now, let me read this to you. This is Numbers 35, 25. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of the blood. And the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled. He shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Did you catch it? When he went to the city of refuge, when we go to Jesus, our refuge, our city. Remember the scripture said that they were free to move around that city and live but with the death of the high priest, it's like the sentence was commuted. He could stay in that city of refuge, but when the high priest died, he was free to go back to his own place, to his own city. He was free to leave the city of refuge and live this. It's like he was free. All chains were broken. All constraints were taken away. All boundaries were removed from the one who had fled to the city of refuge. He went there, and he was safe there, and he could live there and live a fairly decent life, but he still was separated from everything that he knew, from his family from his friends, from his own city. But with the death of the high priest, this one who fleed, it changed everything for him. This brought joyful news because that event enabled him to be removed from his banishment and to terminate the years of painful separation and go back. The avenger could no longer injure him. No matter where he went, the avenger could no longer injure him. He could return happy and secure to the comforts of his long lost home. Now, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? Well, first of all, let me talk to you about the high priest. Hebrews 4.14 says, we have so great a high priest. Hebrews uh, 9.11 says, Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. He came as a high priest of the good things to come. We have a high priest. The whole book of Hebrews is about our high priest, Jesus Christ. It says from the order of Melchizedek. Now that would take me a while to preach too. But we have a high priest who has ushered in a better covenant. You see, we could go to God. We could go to Jesus and live a great life, but he has ushered in something better, a new covenant, a, a new way of living. You see, I don't have to live banished anymore. I don't have to live just in this little place. I get to live completely chain free, completely boundary free because I now am avenged because of my sin, because of the blood that was shed. And because the high priest died, Jesus I get to enjoy a life so amazing, so huge, so full of joy and reward and blessing, hardship, but blessing. I get to live such a life. The Bible calls it a life abundant. In the death of the high priest, it purchased release from spiritual captivity. 
I'm no longer bound by my old nature. I'm no longer bound by sin. I'm no longer bound by my old habits. I'm no longer bound by law. I'm no longer bound by the things that had me chained. I have been released. The law of God can no longer hold me. Justice can no longer threaten me. I can go forth in the glorious liberty of a child of God. Hallelujah. You see, God ordered the cities of refuge to be easily accessible, and he ordered it with the full rich provisions. He made the way as plain as possible to the manslayer of old. I did some research. The cities themselves were generally on a height so as to be seen from a distance. Thank you, Jesus, that my city of refuge was on a height called Mount Calvary. Amen. And the roads that were leading to them were carefully marked and maintained. They were broader than other roads. In fact, there are some historians that say that they were 16 yards wide. That's 15 yards on a football field wide just so people knew how to get to the city of refuge. The Jewish magistrates and judges went once every year to inspect the roads to the cities of refuge and ordered repairs. Where streams occurred, there were bridges built across them. Where there were crossroads, signs with the word refuge were on them set up. Do you not see that God is appointing a way that says refuge? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews, high on a hill in a place that was marked called the Road of Golgotha. You see, God made a plain way to my city of refuge, to your city of refuge. He has done this for us. And so God has done everything for us to make the gospel refuge accessible to everyone. Your parents, your pastors, friends, teachers, Bibles, churches, Christian shows, Christian books. These are all like roads leading and signs to the leading to the city of refuge. Jesus pointing away to the Lord saying, flee, flee for the refuge to lay hold of is a hope of good things to come and liberty in Jesus. Let me give you one more verse. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. We who have fled to him for refuge have a strong consolation or a strong hope. We who have fled to him for refuge have a strong covenant, a strong hope, a strong bond, a strong savior, a strong refuge. We are safe and we are free to live a life of liberty and abundance. Not only because Jesus lived, but because as the high priest, he died. Oh, we who have fled to him for refuge have a strong consolation. Will you not flee to him? Will you not flee to him? Will you not run to the Savior, your refuge, your strength, your very present help in time of trouble? Don't run to the world. Don't run to an answer in the world, to God's, uh, to the world's philosophies or the world's reasonings. Run to the city of refuge. Because the avenger of the blood, Satan himself, cannot enter in, cannot touch your life while you're there. And then with the death of the high priest, you get to go and move about because the avenger no longer has a case against you. You've been found innocent and judged rightly. You never have to be judged again. Your sins were judged at the cross. And the high priest, Jesus, took his blood into the mercy seat and presented it to God and said, it is finished. It is done. And the one who fleed because of sin is now free in the name of the high priest, Jesus. Run to him. 
Run to him. Flee to him and let him be your refuge and your strength and your very present help in time of trouble. Oh, he loves you so much. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die. This Jesus is the greatest love you'll ever know. This Jesus is the greatest love you will ever, ever know. How do I know? Because a long time ago, he took my life and painted a beautiful picture of me with him, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Pfister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.